Why don't you uh, pray and then we'll, we'll jump into our, our subject matter. Father, we uh, do come to you. And uh, uh, Paul's in a storm, a literal storm on the ocean. Things that we can learn uh, about his preparation uh, and how you used him in the midst of it that certainly have uh, application for us. We all have our, our little storms and trials that we go through and certainly uh, ones that are facing, facing the world and our nation today uh, that... Uh, uh, well, things are looking kind of dim out there, Lord, but it could be a, a, a time for us to shine brightly. So we pray that you would uh, use your word to uh, prepare us, uh, to exhort us uh, this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there was a uh, uh, research uh, uh, book written uh, recently, uh, The How of Happiness, is a secular uh, uh, writer. And uh, the gal that did the research talked about the fact that that how people reacted to adverse circumstances uh, uh, was a, a direct, uh, uh, there was a direct relation to uh, their life and their, quote, happiness uh, later in life. One of the examples that she gave was, uh, was this, uh, quoting from, uh, from her book. In one study, researchers in, uh, interviewed men who had had heart attacks between the age of 30 and 60, those uh, who perceived benefits uh, in the event seven weeks after it happened. Uh, for example, believing that they had grown and matured as a result or uh, revalued home life or resolved to create less hectic schedules for themselves were less likely to have reoccurrences and more likely to be healthy eight years later. Uh, in contrast, those who blame their heart attacks on other people or on their own emotions, having been too stressed, uh, were in poor health uh, eight years later. Uh, how we react to circumstances, the, the trial, the circumstances uh, in our life, and certainly the Bible has a, a lot to say about it. Uh, one of those passages is 1 Peter uh, 1.6. Here, Peter writing uh, and the fact that we should be able to rejoice over trials uh, because of the benefit he mentions here. He says, in this uh, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, uh, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ. Peter is saying that, uh, that we go through trials and difficulties. They are grievous. They're, they're very real. Uh, at the same time, uh, they end up proving our faith to be genuine to ourselves, uh, certainly, and to others uh, around us. Again, it's a time where God shows himself faithful to us, that we can rely and trust uh, in his, uh, his promises. A number of years ago, there was, a, uh, for, for a couple of years, there was a bunch of uh, uh, big stadium kind of venue men's events called Promise Keepers. Uh, and I had the uh, opportunity to attend one of those. We were in Southern California. My, my dad and my brother and my brother-in-law all flew down. We went to Anaheim Stadium. Uh, with uh, just uh, me and uh, uh, 50,000 other of my close friends uh, were there. Uh, and they had a great lineup, Chuck Swindoll, Chuck Smith, E.V. Hill. I mean, they just, uh, these guys are great booking agents uh, uh, for the, the uh, preachers and teachers uh, of, of the day. Uh, and we had a great time. Uh, the, the whole premise of the name then is at the end of the event, you get the 50,000 guys to stand and on the big scoreboard, they put up the promises of the promise keeper there were good things, you know, promised to be uh, basically a better Christian, a better father, you know, a better husband, uh, you know, more faithful and so on and so forth. So I don't know how many promises there were to being a promise keeper. Uh, and uh, all of that was kind of uh, predicated from the uh, founder, Coach McCartney, uh, and, um, uh, and, and probably uh, his uh, Roman Catholic background uh, that would uh, kind of have you make promises and obligations to God of what you will do and keep and so, so forth. Uh, but really from a biblical model, uh, it might have been better to call that event the promise keeper. And the promise keeper is God, <laughs> not, not us. I'm just uh, very thankful that uh, my salvation uh, in my Christian life is, is not based on my ability to keep my promises to God, but rather his promises to me. And it might have been and gone a long ways to stand at the end with 50,000 other guys and recite some of the great promises of God's faithfulness uh, to us. Because when we're going through difficulty, when we're going through trials, it's not what I promise to do on God's behalf. It's what he has promised to do on my behalf that counts. And as I see him do that, 
and I've given, I'm given an opportunity uh, to be faithful and trust him in the midst of it, uh, then uh, my own faith, Peter says, will be proved genuine, genuine to me, that it's the real deal. I love the uh, Warren Wordsby uh, quote that uh, faith that is not tested is faith that is not trusted. It's got to be trusted. Uh, you probably know that in your own relationships with husbands and wives. It's going through the trials and the difficulties you go through in marriage that actually strengthens your love one for another. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the, the mundane, the routine. It's the difficulties that really show your love one to another and unite you. And certainly the tr same is true of our own faith. Now, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the uh, Prince of Preachers, uh, wrote in his uh, morning evening devotion uh, based on this 1 Peter 1.7 passage the following. He says, faith untried may be true faith, uh, but it is sure to be little faith. And it is likely to remain dwarfish so long as it is without trials. Faith never prospers so well as when things are against her. Tempests are her trainers and lightnings are her illuminators. When a calm sea reigns, uh, when a calm reigns on the sea, spread the sails as you will. The ship moves not to its harbor for on a slumbering ocean the keel sleeps too. Let the winds rush howling forth, and let the waters lift up themselves. Then, though the vessel may rock, and her deck may be washed with waves, and her mast may creak under the pressure of the full and swelling sail, it is uh, then that she makes headway towards her desired haven. Faith is precious, and its trial is precious too. Uh, and that's what we're going to see with the Apostle Paul here. Uh, and what we're going to see first in verses 1 to 12 is that Paul was prepared for the storm before it came. Uh, and certainly that's uh, an important lesson for us. Uh, again, Paul has made his appeal to Caesar. To Caesar he will go. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, one-way ticket he's been waiting on uh, beginning in verse uh, 12. Again, leaving from uh, uh, Israel from Caesarea Maritima and, uh, and sailing uh, to uh, Italy. It says, and when he, it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan Regiment. So entering a ship of the Adramithium, uh, we put to sea, uh, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonia, Thessalonica was with us, and the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. Verse 7, when we had sailed slowly many days... It arrived with difficulty, Alcinitis, the wind not permitting us to proceed. We sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salamani. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lassia. Now, when much time had been spent and, and uh, sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening towards the southwest and northwest and winter there. So uh, they head off and they're uh, having troubles already. We would say, again, their preparation. Paul was prepared because of the fellowship uh, he kept. My good friend Roger Moses used to say, it's who you hang with. <laughs> and uh, Paul puts it this way in, uh, and, uh, in the New Testament, uh, that uh, bad company corrupts good character. Uh, it was true in the first century. Uh, it is still true today. Paul was prepared because of the people that he was with. Uh, Luke is writing in the first person once again, so he is with him. Verse 1, and when it was decided that we should sail to Italy. 
Luke's been with him uh, for quite some time now uh, on this journey. Uh, and even secular historians write of the uh, first-rate uh, accuracy uh, of Luke uh, as a historian. Uh, and uh, they are very impressed, as you might be as well, of his uh, uh, basically understanding of nautical terms and the sailing and so forth. Some of the interesting details given here. Aristarchus uh, is with them. We saw that, see that in verse 2. Uh, uh, Macedonia, Thessalonica. Uh, Paul describes him in Colossians 4.10 as a fellow prisoner with him. Uh, again, not that he literally is a prisoner, but he's with Paul during these kinds of hardships. Both of these men are there by their own choice. They don't have to be, uh, but they are willing to risk their life. <laughs> and if you hung out with Paul very long, trust me, you're risking your life. They were risking their life to be with Paul and be with him uh, on this, uh, this journey. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, how is it that they came to be on board with him, well, remember Paul is a Roman citizen, as a Roman citizen appealing to Caesar uh, for his day in court with Caesar Nero. On the way, he could bring on board any, any of his slaves that he wanted to bring. Who are those guys? My slaves. Okay, bring them on board. So uh, they were able to accompany him. Uh, and I'm sure it meant a lot to the Apostle Paul to have them with him uh, on this journey. Uh, notice three, the third group here were uh, other prisoners. In verse 1, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners. And the Greek term means others of a different kind. Paul was one type of prisoner, a Roman citizen, uh, uh, receiving a lot of favor from uh, Julius, the, the Roman centurion. Of another kind? Uh, okay, they're another kind. They're the kind of prisoner that are going to prison. In fact, why would they take them all the way to Rome to put them in prison? They weren't going to put them in prison. They were going to put them in the arena. That's the only reason Rome would ship uh, uh, these, uh, these guys there. Uh, for the entertainment of the noble Roman citizens. So they could sit in the Colosseum, uh, be half drunk most of the time, uh, and watch uh, other fellow human beings being eaten alive and torn apart by wild animals. Uh, that was the entertainment uh, of the day, so for the glory of Rome. So there's uh, these uh, men and women that are uh, in a very desperate situation as well. Paul's going to have a chance, of course, to uh, stand up in the midst of the storm because he was prepared before he got there and have an impact, uh, a chance to impact their lives. And then I mentioned uh, the Roman centurion, uh, Julius, of the uh, uh, Augustan regiment. Some translations would say imperial regiment, uh, most likely trained as a personal bodyguard uh, of Nero himself. It's interesting, all of the uh, military officers, Roman officers we meet in the New Testament, they all seem to be men of tremendous integrity, and many of them uh, very open to the gospel, as we see uh, early in the book of Acts with Cornelius, and of course, uh, through the ministry uh, of Jesus as well. Uh, but Paul uh, is uh, prepared for the storm because he's got some people around him that love him, that care about him, that will pray with him and pray for him, and I can tell you, it makes a big difference when you're in the storm. I get calls periodically from people that listen to us uh, on the radio or on the internet. Uh, and the reason they're calling me and wanting to talk to Pastor Tim is because they're, they're in uh, amidst of a trial. They're in the storm. They want prayer. They want some counsel. They want some advice. I'm always happy to uh, give it to them, of course. Uh, one, one thing they have in common is that uh, they're calling me uh, because they don't have their own pastor. Uh, in other words, <laughs> most of the time, they're not in fellowship. Uh, they don't have other believers around them. Uh, they don't have a pastor or their own church, and that's why they're calling me the radio guy. Uh, and uh, I don't mind doing it, uh, but it tells me they were never prepared for the storm before it came. Uh, it's important that uh, it's who we hang with. It has a tremendous influence over our lives. Uh, not only those that we come into daily contact, those voices that might be coming through, well, through, through the radio or TV or movies or the media or music, they all have an influence on us. Who are we associating with? Proverbs warns us, do not associate with an angry man or you may become like him. There's a few angry men <laughs> in the movies these days. Uh, we, need to be, uh, we need to be careful about these things. I'm not saying don't go there, but just please understand uh, the vantage point, the viewpoint uh, of who's producing these things. K. 
Kathy and I went to see the um, uh, new Exodus movie, uh, Gods and Generals, a few weeks ago. I noted on Facebook and a few reviews, there were Christians that were upset about that movie. I didn't really understand why myself. We went to see it. Uh, I wasn't surprised that non-Christians making a movie about biblical themes didn't follow the Bible. See, that didn't surprise me at all. <laughs> I kind of expected that. Uh, when uh, Moses is before the burning bush and God speaks to him on that holy ground as a nine-year-old little boy. See, I wasn't really thrown off like that. I expected that kind of stuff. When they shifted the dates of who the Pharaoh is so the biblical account doesn't line up with e Egyptian history, well, it doesn't surprise me that they do that because Ramsey is a better name than Tut Moses, the guy who was really the Pharaoh during that day. But I still enjoyed the movie. I liked seeing the plagues and <laughs> seeing the, uh, the Red Sea crossing and uh, those things. Awesome special effects. We enjoyed the movie. We weren't surprised by it at all. But if we listen to voices from a non-Christian perspective, associate with that angry man or woman or whatever it might be enough, we'll never be prepared for the storm. If we never have the filters up uh, when we should uh, and no filters at all when we're, well, when we're in the word. It's who we're with, it's who we're associating with. Paul was prepared before he went into the storm. Notice secondly, Paul was prepared for the storm because, well, he did his best to avoid it. And I, and I kind of like this because there's a lot of people that just, they end up in a lot of storms. And I talk to a lot of Christians that they go through difficulties in life, not because of some habitual sin. Certainly that would cause it. Not because uh, the devil has a scheme specific to their lives and some kind of plot, which he does. Most of what Christians go through in difficulty, it's just because of a lot of bad decisions. Bad decisions that they make. Uh, Paul was... Uh, doing his best to avoid the storm, to not fall into it. Uh, and he's actually trying to give them godly counsel uh, at one point in time. Now, once we are in the storm, uh, still, who's ever the effect, who's ever the cause, we still can ask God for wisdom. That's what James says in James 1, 2. Uh, My brother encountered all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Uh, there's an outcome to it. But let patient have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, that is mature, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom in the midst of the trial, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach. In other words, it's okay if you made a bad decision. You were the dummy. Call out to God in the midst of it and ask for some wisdom, and it will be given to you. That's the idea, without reproach. You know, when we're in the middle of it, and we go to God and go, I uh, kind of uh, blew it here. And uh, this thing I'm in and this job I took or this thing that happened, I should have never really been here. God doesn't go, well, I'm not helping you. You never even came to me for counsel. You're an idiot. You shouldn't. God doesn't do that. It's without reproach. If we actually come to him at that juncture, he'll still uh, give us wisdom. Paul tried to avoid the danger ahead. Uh, again, we see that down in verse 10 where he says, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster uh, and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship uh, <coughs> than by the things spoken by Paul. Now, it's interesting. Where did Paul get this tidbit of uh, information that he warns him with? Uh, did God speak to him? Not yet. Not yet. He will later, and he'll say something different. Later, uh, God will appear or speak through an angel to the Apostle Paul on board the ship in the midst of the storm and tell him no life will be lost, but the boat's going down. Paul's saying, you know, if we go out in weather like this, uh, we're going to have real problems. And he's just basing it, basing it on experience uh, and logic and what was reasonable. Verse 9 makes reference to the fast. That's the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement uh, comes in, in the fall, usually late September or, or early October. Uh, it's difficult sailing from September to November. It's impossible to sail from November to February. They're kind of right on the edge of it. If they set sails now, Paul knows it's going to be uh, difficult. Uh, if they delay any longer, they should just wait uh, until after the bad weather passes. What is that based on? It's based on the fact that Paul has sailed over 3,500 miles. 
He's crossed the Mediterranean on ship 11 times. He's been shipwrecked three times, uh, spending, as he mentions, a night and a day in the sea. He probably had more experience on the ocean than most of the guys on the boat who were the sailors. And, uh, and so he's just using reason and logic. Let's be reasonable here. It was good counsel. It was godly counsel, uh, not because he had some epiphany or God spoke to him or gave him a word. No, it was just reasonable. We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't go forward in this. Uh, we shouldn't want <laughs> to, to go into storms. We can avoid some storms. We can avoid some trials if we'll just pray about it, pray it through, seek some godly counsel, uh, be in God's word. Uh, and that's the application here. Listen to the psalmist. This is how they begin, Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't get bad counsel. Nor stands in the paths of sinners. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But in contrast to where you might get advice and counsel, in contrast to that, uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. The results... He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its seed, fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Uh, Paul is prepared before he goes into the storm. Uh, and secondly, then, his faith is proven genuine in the midst of it. Let's pick up our story here again in verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they, they had obtained their desire... Putting out to sea, they sailed close to Crete, but not long, but not long after, a temp tempestuous headwind rose called a Eurachlodon. And yes, I did look it up. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, uh, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clata, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird uh, the ship. And fearing lest they should run aground on the site of sands, uh, they struck sail and so were driven. And because we are exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe uh, God that it will be just as he told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So Paul's, um, Paul's faith is being proven uh, in, this, in this whole thing. He's prepared, and now he's able to rise to the occasion. Uh, and it's very interesting uh, that we'll see in, in the story. We'll see as we continue. Paul's, Paul's basically gone from the, uh, the, the, the little Jewish guy that's the prisoner on board uh, to the guy that's standing up talking to 275 guys and calling the shots. And uh, we're going to see the uh, Roman centurion Julius ends up taking orders from the apostle Paul before this is all over with. Uh, there's a real change uh, in, uh, in the people's willingness, these guys, to listen to this Christian, to this apostle, simply because of the circumstances under and the attitude that he has in, in the midst of it. Paul's the only guy not freaking out. I'm not sure about Luke and Aristarchus. Maybe, maybe they're doing okay and they're probably figuring, well, we're with the Paul. What, what do we expect? You know, we're going in the water, you know, but uh, God said we're going to Rome. We're going to Rome. You know, I mean, there's a uh, just on Wednesday night uh, last week, we were, uh, we were talking about, again, the, uh, going across the Sea of Galilee with, with Jesus and the disciples. And he's in the front of the boat with his head on a pillow. And, uh, uh, you know, a nice, nice touching detail. I appreciate the fact. And his head on a pillow. Uh, fast asleep uh, while this storm is raging around him. Uh, and they're all freaking out, not thinking that, well, uh, Jesus is here. We're going to that side I think we're going to make it for some reason. You know, they're not really thinking it through. Who's with them? Uh, Paul is saying, I know whose I am, and I know who I serve. That's why I'm able to tell you this. 
You know, it's, it's really tough to stand up for God in the midst of, a, a, you know, cancer, uh, the loss of your home, the loss of your career job. Uh, we're talking real, real trials that real people you and I go through. Uh, and when we're in the midst of that, we got to know who's, who we really belong to and who God <laughs> really is. And be pretty, pretty secure uh, in that. Kind of have that Romans 8 down. There's no condemnation and nothing can separate me. And there's a lot of great stuff in between. Uh, there's things in the Bible I need to come back to to remind myself over and over again, like Paul, I know whose I am. I know who I belong to. I know who it is that I'm serving. Because of that, uh, he's able to prove his faith genuine, we're saying, in the severity of the storm. Mm -hmm. Well, how severe was it? This, uh, this word, Eurachlodon, you know, I, I worked hard at it, so I just have to be able to say it a few times. Uh, it means it was uh, sometimes trans translated uh, northeastern. It means it's hurricane force. Uh, and uh, uh, Josephus writes about being on the Mediterranean in a similar kind of storm on a ship much bigger. It held 600 people, and it went down. Uh, so this is a, a tremendous storm here uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, notice they take steps to try to save the boat. We secured the skiff or the lifeboat with, uh, with difficulty. In other words, it's being pulled uh, aside the boat, behind the boat. They're worried about it smashing against uh, the boat, uh, against the stern, so they bring it on board. They run ropes or cables uh, underneath the, the ship to try to uh, uh, gird it up a bit and make it stronger. Uh, they're throwing stuff o overboard, the ship's tackle and so forth. Uh, verse 20, uh, with, uh, now with neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. Uh, they did not have a compass nor a sextant. They could not navigate without the sun, without the stars. That means they've gone days and they have no idea where, where they're at uh, at this juncture, which leads then to verse 20. Uh, all hope that we would be saved was finally uh, given up. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're in that situation with people uh, and all hope of being saved is given up, there are a lot of times they're a lot more open to the gospel. <laughs> they, don't, they don't mind you saying, hey, would you like me to pray for you? Oh, absolutely. I, you, know, there's, you know, when people are in very difficult circumstances, I mean, you've got to be uh, pretty hardcore to say, no, I don't want any prayer. And unless you're like the guy that got thrown off the plane the other day because somebody said Merry Christmas to him. I don't know if you heard that story. He raised such a fuss over it, they had to stop the plane and throw the guy off. There's a few of those guys out there. But by and large, uh, people uh, you know, are open to the gospel when they have no hope at all of being, uh, of being saved. There's, uh, uh, the, our military faces... Uh, uh, a, a lot of, uh, uh, as Christians, a lot of resentment uh, and a lot of uh, uh, concern over them sharing their faith. Uh, this comes right down from the top, uh, from the administration uh, and so forth. Very difficult for them. They have to be very, uh, very careful about sharing their faith. They can, but they just got to be very careful about it, when and where and so forth. Uh, but when uh, everybody's life is on the line, uh, and one of those Christians, and I'm, I'm talking from uh, you know, personal experience of uh, some of our guys uh, when they say, well, hey, uh, do you mind if I say a prayer before we head on on this mission? Everybody's like, no, that's, that's an awesome idea. Yeah, you, you, you do that. Uh, it's kind of like this. Uh, there are circumstances God might place us under that aren't real pleasant, uh, but and if we'll believe him and trust his promises and know that we're his, we belong to him, he is sovereign over all these things. He's got a reason and a purpose. Uh, it gives us a, a platform. Uh, and we see that here with the, uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, uh, Paul's faith, secondly, is proven genuine. Again, uh, as I mentioned, it's because it's uh, who he belonged to. We see that in verses 21 to 23. Uh, and then it's proven genuine uh, as it allows him to deliver God's uh, word. He's able to say, keep up your courage. Not one of you will be lost and only the ship will be lost. Verse 24, and indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So uh, I think obviously uh, Paul is, uh, uh, has been praying uh, for them and uh, concerned uh, over them, and, uh, and God is uh, answering that prayer, and uh, they are all going to be concerned. Uh, but Paul is able to do this because he believes the promises uh, of God. And uh, I just encourage you as a real practical uh, matter in, uh, in your own devotions, your own quiet time with the Lord. It's not a bad thing to uh, have a little journal or something and 
uh, and write down when you're in the midst uh, the promises that you're believing. Uh, and then to be able to look at those later and see how God's been faithful to you uh, in the past. You know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Jews in the Old Testament, you know, they were, uh, they were uh, big on trying to remember, you know, and uh, when they crossed the Jordan River, uh, the instruction from Joshua is uh, get 12 large stones from out of the middle of the river and pile them up here one on top of the other. We need to remember this day what God has done for us in the past so that we might believe him and trust him uh, in the future. I, I, what I do personally is, uh, you know, I read the proverb, whatever the date is, you know, we're the first, second, right through the month. Isn't that convenient? There's 31. Uh, and, uh, and in that, I, I'm, not, I'm not a journaler. You know, uh, my wife, is, she's got... Uh, Volumes of, uh, of journals that she's written over over the year. Uh, I, I'm not a journal, but I, I'll write little notes in the proverbs. Uh, you know, things that we're praying for, things that have happened, uh, things that maybe relate to something in the proverbs, or maybe it just relates because of the date uh, of the proverb itself. Uh, and one of the things that's uh, that's great about that is uh, it kind of begins to accumulate uh, over the years. As you're now, as you're reading the proverbs, you're encouraged by the proverbs, but you're like, "Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and, you know, we came through the other side of that, and God was faithful in that." Uh, it's just a very good practical thing to do uh, in helping us believe and trust the promises of God uh, in the midst of a storm. So Paul is prepared. It has a lot to do with who he hangs with. Uh, his faith is proven genuine. Uh, and we say, thirdly, that puts him in a position to minister as a result of the storm. Verse 27. Now, when the 14th night had come, uh, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that we were drawing near some land. And they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms, 120 feet. And when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms, 90 feet. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, uh, when they had lit down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, the front of the boat, uh, Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff uh, and let it fall. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day. Uh, you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors and left them in the sea. Meanwhile, loosing the rudder ropes, they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for the shore. But striking a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground. And the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. And the soldiers planned to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and head to land. Uh, and the rest, who could surf, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Now, I just... Obviously, they're riding boards through the surf. We just don't know if they stood up or not. It's very clear some of them surfed. I'm assuming the Apostle Paul himself. I looked relentlessly for a picture of that, but uh, that, that artwork has never been done. Maybe that's a stained glass window waiting to happen. I don't know. But Paul was in a position to encourage others. And uh, uh, again, verse 27, there's a reason for the men uh, to be discouraged in the 14th night. We are still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. So there, there are a couple of weeks uh, into this, and nobody's eating a thing. Uh, that tells you the ship is just pitching a bit <laughs> out, out there. Uh, none of them are, are eating. Uh, they're in what's called today the Ionian Sea. 
Uh, they begin to take soundings. They're 120 feet out. They're 90 feet out. They realize they're getting closer to some kind of shore, some kind of, uh, of land. So they, uh, uh, they basically drop four anchors uh, off the stern to try to slow themselves. And it puts a drag and keeps them heading uh, straight and so forth with the wind. Uh, and of course, uh, they are able to see the beach eventually <coughs> cut the anchors and try to uh, make a run for the beach. Uh, we'd say secondly about Paul's position, uh, he was able to help prepare for what lie ahead, verse 31. Uh, unless these men stay uh, in the ship, uh, you cannot be saved. Now, even when Paul mentioned before, uh, as, you re as we just read uh, a little while ago, he said to them, you remember what I said to you in Crete, why we shouldn't have gone on this trip? Now, I don't think he's trying to pour salt in a wound. I think he's just trying to gain credibility. He said, he said, you might recall at this point that everything I said was going to happen has happened. So maybe you might want to listen at this juncture here uh, in, our, in our little uh, ship cruise uh, on the Mediterranean. Uh, and now he's in a position where uh, he's able to save these, uh, these men's lives. Uh, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Uh, and the centurion at this point, Mr. Julius, Officer Julius says, Yes, sir, Apostle Paul. <laughs> you're, obviously, you're calling the shots here, uh, and, uh, and these men's lives are, uh, are saved. Uh, and then Paul gets them all together, encourages them, said they should try to eat something, be prepared for, for going overboard and what's uh, coming up in the uh, immediate future. And notice in verse 35, when he said these things, he took bread, gave thanks to God in the presence uh, of, of them all. And uh, of those other 275 uh, guys, maybe men and women, uh, that are out there, some of them prisoners. Uh, I don't think uh, any of them was saying, I don't feel like praying. I'm offended that you would bring that up at this juncture. I See, I don't, that doesn't seem to be happening here. Uh, they all think they're going to die. Uh, Paul's the only guy that seems to know uh, what he's doing, or what he's talking about. And when he says, hey, let's pray, everybody's like, I think that's an awesome idea. Uh, and it's, it's a position and a platform Paul was given at this juncture to speak and to demonstrate his faith to these other men that are on this ship because he was prepared before it happened. Uh, he was able to trust and believe the promises of God and know whose he was and who it was that he was serving and that he was sovereign over these things. And Paul knew by now, <laughs> after, after three other shipwrecks, uh, that if, if God was putting them in the water, it was for a reason. And it might have been for just this occasion here. So even at this juncture, uh, with the ship being uh, pitched all around, uh, they stop and uh, he prays before they, uh, they eat. Which reminds me of a, of a cute little uh, J. Vernon McGee story. He tells the story of a little boy uh, who was uh, raised in a Christian home. Uh, of course, prayed for every meal with his parents and so forth. And he went to a neighbor's house uh, to eat dinner. Uh, and as they sat down at the table, everybody just kind of dove in right, right away. Uh, and so he asked them, uh, uh, don't, don't you pray uh, before you eat? Uh, and they said, no, we just eat. And he says, well, that's what my dog does. <laughs> good, good, to, good to give thanks ahead of time. And, uh, uh, and even in the midst of this, Paul, Paul is doing this. Verse 38, they lighted the ship. And threw out the wheat into the sea. So uh, again, an interesting series of events. Uh, God has promised Paul he'd be saved. Uh, and those that are with him, Paul's believing that promise. He's giving open thanksgiving to, uh, to, uh, to Jehovah God in front of a bunch of pagans. Uh, and, uh, and again, they've all at this point surrendered their authority to the apostle Paul. Paul says, we're going to pray. We're praying. Paul says to uh, the centurion, don't let those guys get away. Yes, sir. It's just kind of an interesting turn of events, how God can use a person uh, if they believe and trust God when horrible things are happening to them, when horrible things are happening to them. And uh, uh, it's just, uh, you know, God wants to, to use our lives and sometimes uh, to get us in a position to actually speak into other people's lives. Uh, it, it takes, uh, you know, uh, it being the cancer word, you got to have cancer. Yeah, I mean, to, to get to these places where people have lost all hope. This is not all kind of witnessing. This is not uh, uh, the, the outcome of every Christian's life. Uh, but some of, some of us, 
uh, will be th thrown into uh, horrific circumstances, storms, trials. Uh, James and, and Peter said, you know, well, don't be surprised for one thing. Uh, and there is a, a good outcome uh, as a result of it. Uh, your faith is being proved genuine. Uh, you're going to develop uh, perseverance and with that character and so forth. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with just the platform that God gives us uh, as a result. Uh, again, verse 42, the soldiers plan to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim away, uh, swim away uh, and escape. Uh, but the centurion wanting to save Paul uh, kept them from their purpose. If you were a soldier and you were guarding a guy that had life, uh, life sentence on him, uh, and he escaped, you served the life sentence. Uh, if he was supposed to be executed and he escaped, you would be executed. So that's, that's why they're like, uh, they're just going to kill them all. That, 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 that's the easiest solution here. Uh, none of us will bear the consequences then. Uh, but their lives are spared because of one man believing the promises of God. Again, uh, practical lessons, uh, uh, very obvious here. Uh, storms of what we see in our own lives, there are storms of perfection and storms of correction. Uh, just because you go through a storm or a difficult time, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you've done anything wrong. We see the, uh, the disciples uh, on at least a couple occasions in the midst of a storm, a literal storm, life-threatening storm in the Sea of Galilee, absolutely in God's will. Jesus says, get in the boat and go to the other side. They did, and man, here's a storm. They think they're all, all going to die. Uh, it was a storm of perfection to bring maturity uh, in, in their lives. Uh, there might have been some maturing going on here with Luke and Aristarchus, uh, but uh, uh, there might have been some correcting going on in some other people's lives as well. Jonah is an example of a storm of correction. Uh, again, a, a literal storm to kind of fit our metaphor here. Uh, Jonah is a rebellion against God, refuses to do what God wants him to do, uh, jumps on a ship, gets caught in a storm, and God bring, brings that storm to correct him and bring Jonah back into God's will. Sometimes God does that. He loves us enough to discipline us. He'll bring a trial and so forth. And uh, I know you're thinking already, well, I'm not taking any cruises unless I'm really right with the Lord. But uh, uh, it, it may not be a, a literal in the ocean kind of storm. It could just be a trial, storms of perfection, storms of, uh, of correction. Uh, storms have a way, secondly, of revealing a person's character. Remember the, uh, the sailors who were going to jump in the lifeboat and kind of and try to save themselves and abandon uh, everybody else. And Paul says, if those guys get away, we're all going to die. Uh, they cut the ropes and let the, uh, the boat go away. Uh, storms, uh, sometimes God brings into our lives, again, like the correct and like the perfect, just to show us what's in our own hearts, because sometimes uh, we, we don't even see it ourselves. Uh, there was a, a great little story in one of the biographies of Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Missions, uh, and there was a young guy, guy that was applying to the mission, wanted to serve with him in China and so forth. Hudson Taylor takes this young guy into a, a tea shop and orders tea, uh, and they sit down, and uh, once it's served, uh, they've only been chatting for just a moment, uh, and then Hudson Taylor kind of freaks the guy out by lifting his knees under the table, and he starts jostling the, the table all over the place. This guy's a little taken aback by that, and then Hudson Taylor stops uh, and says that uh, when, when trials and difficulties come and things start shaking, what's on the inside will be on the outside. There was tea all over the, the table. That's what will happen to you. If you want to be part of this ministry, you'll have to expect these things. I hope your heart is right, because what's on the inside, under difficulty and strain, it'll come on the outside. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes God allows those storms in our lives to even show us uh, what's in our hearts and what needs to be corrected. Storms ca cannot hide the face of God, number three. They can't hinder his purposes. Paul gets there. Paul will arrive in Rome. We'll see that uh, uh, in our next study uh, in Acts. We know from church history he did appear for, before Caesar Nero, uh, and we'll see that his ministry in Rome was uh, uh, very fruitful, and in particular in the household of uh, Nero itself. Storms cannot hide the face of God nor hinder his purpose. And for uh, the obvious, storms give us opportunities to serve others uh, and share the gospel. Uh, we need to just take courage and stay on board uh, in the midst of it. Keep our eyes on the Lord. Amen? Well, let's pray. Lord, uh, we certainly want to pray for anyone here that's going through a storm, a trial, a difficult, whether it's finances, whether it's health, whether it's something of a, of a relationship with someone else that's uh, 
they love dearly and this uh, broken and shattered. Lord, I pray that they could uh, look to you, not remember promises they've made, but uh, remember and rely upon promises you made to us, like you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us. Lord, that, that we might have that uh, eternal perspective. We know whose we are uh, and who we can trust. Uh, Lord, we're so thankful for the promises that you give us. Help us to remember them and to rely upon them. Lord, and even to then anticipate how you might use us uh, in the midst. So we pray for that grace and that courage, Lord, uh, to be upon anyone that maybe is going through something even this morning. Lord, we pray that you would uh, strengthen them, that you would give them that godly counsel. Uh, we think of the verse we read in James, that uh, even in the midst of it, Lord, you, we can ask for uh, wisdom and you'll give it without reproach. And uh, I love that. Uh, when we're in the midst of it, you're not going to come in and kind of remind us uh, of the bad decisions or whatever it might be. Lord, you, you just come in and uh, administer to us uh, by your grace. And we, we pray that you would do that. Lord, for uh, so many others, it's preparation time. It's an evaluation time. Am I being prepared? Am I preparing? Because uh, it's pretty clear that we will all go through trials uh, don't be surprised when you fall into fiery trials. We shouldn't be surprised by it. We should anticipate it. We're thankful it's not constant. It comes in waves. Uh, are we being prepared? Who are we with? Who do we spend time with? Do we spend adequate time with you, with others? Uh, are we being built up in our most holy faith so that we can trust you? Lord, I pray that would be the case for so many of us today, Lord. So. Lord, help us to kind of take what we need from uh, your word this morning, from these few exhortations, apply them to our heart, Lord, uh, and know that uh, you give them to us out of your love and grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I worship you. Surrender all I am. And I run to you, and I fall at your feet. I feel your grace embrace.
I've done from where I've been from death to life to this world's end I'm breaking down the walls that have been keeping me Sir. 